question. We're glad that you're all here this morning for the Mississippi Humanities Council Teacher of the Year presentation by our very own Matthew Johnson. Um, I had a wonderful thing to share with y'all about being here on a rainy Friday, and it's not raining anymore, so I'm going to skip it, and I will just be glad that it's not raining. Um, so at this time, um, I'm going to turn it over to our president, uh, Dr. Michael Heindel, to give us a quick welcome. Good morning, everybody, and it's uh, great to see you here. What an awesome turnout. Thank you all for being here. Um, what a treat we're about to experience. No pressure, Matt. But um, <laughs> we, again, I, I'm really excited to hear him in this lecture. And um, I just want to, again, thank you all for being here today. And I just want to say happy Friday on a Friday before spring break. I mean, we can all get excited about that. Happy Friday on a Friday before spring break. Right. And, um, Thank you, uh, so, so many instructors are in the room. Thank you, uh, administration staff in the room. Thank y'all for being here and, and in support of, of, of Matt and also the, the our Humanities Council uh, Instructor of the Year, and that's a big deal. And so um, I'm also pleased to um, welcome Ms. Carla Faulkner, uh, representing the Mississippi, Mississippi Humanities Council. Carla, thank you for being here. That's, that's a big deal that you're here. So thank you for being here. And I just want to uh, acknowledge our, um, our executive team, many of whom are in the room. Thank you all for being here. I won't, I won't go through the names here because I may miss somebody, but I see several of our executive team here in the room. And um, again, excited about today, and I will conclude my remarks at this point. But thank you all again for being here. And um, I think we come to the point now where we we're presenting the award, right? So Carla, would you, if you don't mind coming up, would y'all join me in thanking Carla for being here this morning? Oh, it's exciting to be here this morning. You know, MHC sponsors these programs throughout the state and other programs to help Mississippians reflect on who we are in relation to our history and our culture and each other. Our program, whether it's a lecture like this, like you'll hear this morning, a, a panel discussion, a museum exhibit, encourages civil discourse as we explore issues important to understanding ourselves. Now, we at the Mississippi Humanities Council are very aware that no one does more to promote the humanities than our teachers in the classroom. I mean, already this morning I have heard how Matt Johnson has turned someone into a lover of history that never thought so before Lisa. <laughs> um, therefore, every year we ask every college and university in the state to honor one of their humanities scholars with the title of humanities teacher. And we ask them to share the scholarship, which Matt will do this morning. We are also looking forward to honoring Mr. Johnson at our Public Humanities Award in Jackson on March 22. Now, MHC is a private, nonprofit corporation funded by Congress through the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our motto is, the humanities are for everyone. And we thank you for being here as Mr. Johnson brings the humanities to you. Matt. Houston, Texas. We won't hold that against you. Uh, but he attended the University of Mississippi, uh, where he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in history. And he also has advanced coursework in the field as well. Matt has been a Northwest Oxford campus faculty member since 2006. It's a pretty impressive career. He is a seasoned instructor who is innovative in the classroom and dedicated to the field of history. As the former District Director of Social Sciences and fellow PTK advisor, I've had the pleasure of knowing Matt for some time. He has served Northwest in the classroom as history faculty, a PTK advisor, coordinator of the Honors Institute on the Oxford campus, and he's been a part of so many committees, events, and recruiting efforts for Northwest. Matt is a scholar and a leader. 
He is a true oldest rebel, and he would always be my first pick on a trivia team. <laughs> We're excited to take this journey with you, Matt, uh, through the evolution of American ideals about liberty from 1688 to 1800, a new liberty, roots, radicalism, and repercussions of the American Revolution. I give you Matthew Johnson. Just, 
they regarded the Catholic Church as an illegitimate religion. They weren't simply wrong, they were evil. Because in their mind, the Protestant faith, that's the one true Christian church. Well, as they saw it, truth is singular. There's not truths, there's not my truth, his truth, their truth, our. it's the truth, it's singular, and it comes from God. Everything else is false, and it comes from the devil himself, from the father of lies. So they believed there was this papist conspiracy, as they called it, whereby the, the devil himself established the Catholic Church as a false church, administered by the Antichrist, the Pope, with his willing minions, the Catholic monarchs across Europe, in an effort to accumulate all power and all wealth into their hands, with which to destroy and discredit the true Protestant church and then oppress God's true faithful Protestants, Christians. Well, these are some pretty big uh, uh, strikes against the king. Despite the red flags, though, at this early point, few in England were willing to openly rebel or worse, you know, plunge the nation into civil war. Well, it did not take long, though, before they realized that James would prove to be a bigger nightmare than they ever feared. Any hope they may have had that maybe he, we, he just won't be so bad, well, those, those hopes soon do, you know, came to be uh, ill-placed. James proved ever bit the absolutist that he really promised to be, and with that absolute power, he did attempt not just to offer religious freedom for the Catholics, as he kind of promised, but to convert, to reinvent the, the Protestant church, the Church of England, into a Catholic institution. So he wanted to Catholicize the whole country. Now, time won't permit us to go through the long laundry list of James' tyranny. That would you know, put us here until next week. But just a few examples to illustrate. So James regularly ignored Parliament, just dismissed their authority completely. He illegally imposed taxes without the consent of Parliament as English law had demanded for 400 years at this point. He replaced a number of officials from his ruling council and the leading ministers of government. He removed several bishops from the Church of England. He removed many college professors and administrators of Oxford and Cambridge. And of course, he replaced them with his own loyal Catholic buddies. He removed many city officials, the mayors and city councilmen, and replaced them with his own loyal Catholic buddies. He seized control of the militia to build a monopoly on the fighting forces of England, and of course, replaced the military commanders with his own loyal Catholic buddies. He arrested numerous people because his goon squad did not like the Protestant books sitting on their library shelves at home. He illegally arrested a number of printers because they had the temerity to print a Protestant Bible. He canceled numerous city charters and the charters of the four New England colonies. So much of James's tyranny was felt on our side of the Atlantic as well. So for many people in England then, this papist conspiracy did not seem like some wild fantasy fringe conspiracy theory. It was a fact, it was their living reality. So opposition to James began to mount you know, pretty furiously, pretty quickly. Well, three years into his reign, in 1688, Parliament had enough, and they declared the throne forfeit, seizing the crown away from James and offering it instead to his daughter and son-in-law, William and Mary, the Prince and Princess of Orange, whose armies arrived from the Netherlands to find overwhelming applause and acclaim. So this glorious revolution of 1688, as it's called. Well, Parliament chose William and Mary because both were staunchly opposed to absolutism and virulently opposed to Catholicism. So they seemed the, the much safer choice to you know, take care of the absolutist and papist problem. Well, this glorious revolution occurred in America as well, though it's rarely talked about in, in history courses. All four of the New England colonies and New York and uh, Maryland rose up and overthrew by violence the colonial administrators because they had been in league with James. There was about to be an uprising in Virginia until those administrators wisely came out and declared for William and Mary. 
So with this glorious revolution then of 1688, it, it, it proved to be a monumental development in English history and by extension American because it established a constitutional monarchy ending forever to this very day the idea of absolutism in England. So several ideals of liberty, as they are currently understood in Great Britain to this day, really took root in 1688. One, the idea of parliamentary supremacy. Now remember, William and Mary bore the crown, not by right of inheritance, not by the divine right of kings, because they, you know, God just threw it down from heaven, but because Parliament offered it to them. Well, crowns aren't offered from below. They're offered from above. Whoever can offer a crown, that suggests that person or that group is the, the, the superior power. In this case, it's Parliament. Well, related to this, another ideal developed of king in Parliament. Sovereign power, supreme political authority, the English declares, no longer is in the hands of the king unilaterally. Now, the king was still the sovereign. To this day, the king, what is he, Charles III, is the sovereign of Great Britain. British wars are fought by His Majesty's troops. His Majesty prosecutes criminals in His Majesty's own courts, administered by His Majesty's Lord Judges. So the King is still the Sovereign. But after 1688, no longer exercises sovereign power. Parliament does. So the development of, of the glorious revolution that held relocated sovereignty away from the king to king in parliament. Third, parliament then wrote up the Declaration of Rights. It's, it's a forerunner of our own Bill of Rights. So it's a long list of all the rights of free Englishmen. It's everything you would expect to find there is there. Freedom of speech and gun rights and due process guarantees and trial by jury and you know, all those matters that we see in our Bill of Rights as well. So liberty was secured in Great Britain, or in England, it's not Great Britain yet, in England. But liberty is not the same thing as equality. Those are two separate concepts. They don't necessarily attend one another. So all men now have rights, but only the upper class few would actually enjoy power. The lords and the leading gentlemen of the realm exclusively would rule in England, not the middle class and certainly not the working class. Well, also, obviously, a monarchy is not a republic. Conventional wisdom held that republics just don't work. It's a failed experiment. At this point, there was a 100% fail rate for republics. There had never been one that actually survived and actually preserved liberty ever before. So they believe that for a society to flourish and for liberty to, to flourish, there has to be a king. You have to have like a nucleus of a cell holding it together. If you remove that king, as a republic does, well then all these competing factions and interests will just pull the republic apart and it leads to chaos. There has to be a king, they thought. Well, as they were learning, they didn't want an absolute monarchy because that leads to tyranny. Well, they didn't want the opposite evil of a republic because that's chaos. They thought that a constitutional monarchy was the responsible middle ground. The monarchy to provide order, but the constitution to provide for liberty. So the constitutional monarchy, liberty under a monarchy. That was the British understanding of liberty after 1688. Well, with greater liberty came greater economic liberty came greater economic growth. England became a powerhouse. It became one of, if not the, richest nation in the world. Just this huge explosion of manufacturing. Well, all of that required greater trade with their American colonies. So the colonies came to serve as an important market, number one, to obtain raw materials and natural resources from, but then also a big market to sell manufactured goods to. So the mother country and the colonies were drawing closer and closer together, you know, bound by the cords of commerce. Well, the colonists had always regarded themselves as very proud Englishmen, but that was becoming even more true throughout the 18th century. Now, this is an important consideration because 
really not so very long ago that we used to think, I mean, even historians who are supposed to know better, that the American Revolution was inevitable. The theory was, well, you know, the mother country was here, and the colonies were way over there, and they just never really interacted. They just drifted further and further apart, and like a couple that never spends time together, divorce is just around the corner. But we now know that's not true because of trade. The two were aligning themselves more and more tightly. So that just shows, you know, that the colonists, the, the irony here is that the closer we got to the American Revolution, the colonists had never been so thoroughly British and proud to be so. Just shows how radical the American Revolution must end up being to poison an otherwise harmonious marriage. So between Britain and the colonists, everything was peachy keen until 1763, when the Brits were finally victorious over their ancient foe in the French and Indian War. That's a good outcome for the Brits, but it left them with a mountain of debt. It's a serious problem that had to be addressed sooner rather than later. Well, for many British rulers, the solution was obvious. Tax the colonies, let them pay for their fair share. Well, up until this point, the colonists had been paying taxes to themselves. New Yorkers pay taxes to New York, and Georgians pay taxes to Georgia. The new approach would be they would start paying taxes directly to Great Britain. Well, British rulers justified this new measure, saying, you know, by what right can we tax our colonies? Well, number one, because we're the mother country and we say so, but also because we must. We have to address and pay down this debt for the good of the realm, for the good of everybody. Well, this justification might have made sense to British ears, but the colonists saw matters quite differently, had a very different perspective. The colonists objected. They screamed absolute bloody murder on every single tax because they believed them not to be merely inconvenient or too expensive or burdensome, but because, in their view, the taxes were illegal. They denied that Parliament had any authority whatsoever to levy this tax. So it wasn't the price tag that they objected to. It was the existence of the tax to begin with, the mere principle of taxes. But why? Why, in their view, did Parliament lack this authority? Well, remember the old phrase we all learned in fifth grade, no taxation without representation. Parliament does not represent us, they said, so therefore Parliament does not act in our name or under our authority, and so therefore it has absolutely no authority whatsoever. But our colonial assemblies, they are our chosen representatives. They alone speak for us, so they alone hold this authority to tax us. We tax ourselves through our representatives. We cannot, as a free society, be taxed by some outside group over whom we have absolutely no power, no taxation without representation. Well, on one hand, from this early day, the colonists rely on traditional British understandings of liberty, individual rights, plus the supremacy of the legislature. But even before they were aware of what they were doing, they were subtly moving beyond the British system because they were starting to reimagine the empire, in their mind, redesigning it as a federal <coughs> empire. And they thought that, they argued out loud, that they were not even tied to England at all, but rather to the king. There is no realm, there, are, there is an empire of multiple realms. England is one constituent realm in a larger empire under the king, under Parliament. Well, New Jersey is a separate realm in the same empire, under the king, under the New Jersey Assembly. South Carolina, a third realm within the empire, under the king, under the South Carolina Assembly. And so we're all tied to the king, not to England. So not only, in their mind anyway, because the Brits had a different understanding, not only did they deny Parliament's authority over them, they denied even being connected to England whatsoever. So they were trying subtly to redefine, relocate sovereignty, you know, supreme power, away from king and parliament to king in the colonial assembly, elevating their own colonial assemblies as its own parliament. 
So that's a, an important departure from the British understanding. Well, again, because they considered these taxes illegal and a tax on liberty, they resisted, often with extreme violence. Well, mass resistance, of course, was met with mass British repression. And again, we won't go through the long train of abuses, you know, to tell the whole story, but illegal taxes, illegal searches without search warrants, and they require search warrants just like today. Britain tried on numerous occasions to subject the colonists illegally to military tribunals rather than the traditional right to trial by jury. Britain illegally subjected numerous colonies to military occupation and Massachusetts to outright military rule. Several colonial assemblies illegally were suspended and the Massachusetts assembly illegally completely abolished. So really, really heavy-handed British repression here. Well, through all this resistance, the colonists began asking the question they never anticipated asking. Can we really take refuge, and should we take refuge, in the British system? Constitutional monarchy is supposed to promote liberty, yet that hasn't happened. Here we stand, groaning under tyranny. So, has the system, is it a good system that's just been corrupted, which suggests that it can be fixed? Or is maybe the system itself a failure? Is the system a sufficient safeguard for our liberties? They weren't sure how to answer. They wrestled with this question. But it fueled their resistance all the more. Ultimately reaching to that fateful day, April 19th, 1775 when the British Redcoats openly began to invade America. The battles of Lexington and Concord, the revolution now on. Well, instantly, a good number of Americans declared it is time for independence. They came out for independence. The patriots, they called themselves. Well, at first, this will change, but at first, the majority of Americans were not yet prepared to go that route. Resistance against British tyranny, absolutely. But resistance from within the empire, not independence from it. The war continued a few more months, taking us to January 1776, when Thomas Paine, an absolute nobody, a working class schlub, was about to change the world forever. Thomas Paine had this bold vision of an independent America. So he sat down and angrily wrote up this pamphlet to outline the case for American independence in terms he thought were so obvious, so self-evident that it was common sense for independence. George III is a tyrant. And so as free men, we should stand up and fight for our God-given liberties. And when we win, and we will, because our ideas are better, we should build ourselves, he wrote, not into a British-style monarchy, but an American-style republic. Constitutional monarchy, the God that failed. It's supposed to promote liberty, and yet it has not. Now, Thomas Paine was well aware of the history problem. There still was the 0% success rate. But Thomas Paine and those adopting his view were undeterred. We will make the Republic a success. Well, how can we succeed? Because the Greeks didn't, and the Romans didn't, and Milan didn't, and Florence didn't, and the Swiss didn't, and the Dutch, I mean, no one else has. How can we succeed? Well, Thomas Paine wrote, because we're American, that's why. Because we treasure our liberty. The love of freedom burns in our very souls. We can be, we will be, that bright, shining city on a hill, a light of hope to the oppressed throughout the world, a call to arms to rise up and free themselves from the shackles, from the yoke of monarchy. We can be a free people, ruling ourselves without a king, without an aristocracy. Well, he wrote with such power and conviction and passion above all else but the cause, not just of liberty, and not even just of independence, but of republicanism spread like wildfire. By the way, common sense outsold in the entire world 
every book except the Bible. All countries were trying to get their hands, see what is so radical about this American nobody, the cause was spreading. Finally, by later that summer, 1776, all 13 colonies were declared, were prepared to declare independence from Great Britain. So the task fell to Thomas Jefferson to draft the Declaration. There was no better man for the job. Jefferson was the ablest writer and possessed the keenest mind of time. So how does this, this declaration you know, reflect these principles? Because Jefferson's death is such an important document, not just because it declared independence, but because of what's in there. It perfectly encapsulated that spirit of 76, British ideals of liberty, plus the new American ideas of republicanism. Well, he starts off with the famous words, all men, quote, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, by itself, this concept of natural rights was not terribly radical, at least not the Anglo-American world, because even the Brits accepted this 100 years earlier. But Jefferson added, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. For Jefferson, for Americans now, government's not natural. It doesn't just simply exist. It, it has not just existed since time immemorial. It's not part of God's holy created order. But rather, it's the creature of people. The people, at some point, for their own purpose of securing their liberties, created their government. So, this is an important development because now Americans were relocating sovereignty, not in the king, not king in parliament, not even king in the colonial assembly, but the people themselves. The government is not sovereign. The people who create that government, they alone are the sovereign. Sovereignty originates and remains in the hands of the people. So this conception of popular sovereignty in a republic was not merely different but radically different from, from British understandings. Well, Jefferson continued even more, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. There's a right to revolution. The people have a right to defend and vindicate their rights, even from and especially from their own government. So how is this right to revolution radical? Well, imagine today you hop on Facebook and you write that you declare the president to be a tyrant and an enemy of the liberties of the people. And you call on all American patriots to grab the guns out of their closet, meet you in DC, and together violently overthrow the tyrant. <coughs> if you write those words on Facebook, I got news for you. The FBI will find you by the end of the day, and you will be caught off as a domestic terrorist. So openly espousing these words today will land you in prison. As radical as they were, though, and unthinkable as it may be, this was common fare in 1776. Well, the declaration was written, approved, declared officially. The war dragged on another five years. Yada, yada, yada. The Battle of Yorktown where the combined forces of the Americans and the French allies defeated the British and captured General Lord Cornwallis, effectively ending the war. Well, at their surrender, the British military band played a song called The World Turned Upside Down. The Brits understood perfectly well how radical and unthinkable this revolution really was. Just absolutely unthinkable, unheard of. Yada, 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 some more. They wrote and adopted the Constitution. Well, the Declaration perfectly summed up the principles of 76, but it carried no force of law. That's what the Constitution was for, to enshrine these ideas into the fundamental law of this new republic. So how does the Constitution reflect these ideals? Again, we won't go through every single example because that would take forever, but just a few examples here. Probably the most well-known regarded feature of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. It's the long list of the rights of free people. And a lot of this is word for word from the British Declaration of Rights. So again, this just 
reflect, you know, they still believe in the British ideals of liberty. But the Constitution went further, adding more radical features that at the time were unique to Americans. The opening words, the preamble to the Constitution reads as follows. We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Again, the idea here of popular sovereignty. Power is in the hands of the people. Not the government itself, not one government official, but no government at all. Because the government is the creature of the people. They can't be the sovereign. It is the people who are sovereign who create a government to create, to protect their natural rights. Well, furthermore, the Constitution enumerates, is the fancy word, lists the powers of Congress and the President and the Supreme Court in pretty clear, concrete terms. Well, that's a far cry from these vague English notions of the sovereignty of Parliament. It's much more specific. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's laid out much more clearly than that. Again, popular sovereignty, the sovereign people delegating power to their representatives. Well, not only are these powers enumerated, they are separated. And that is, you know, Congress will write the law and the president will enforce and the Supreme Court will interpret. The idea here was to distribute power broadly so that no one person or group of people could concentrate power, hold excessive power into their hands, because that's what leads to corruption and then, of course, to tyranny. Well, the process to ratify or amend later the Constitution. It's not the government itself that ratifies or approves or amends the Constitution, but once again, the people, popular sovereignty. It was their understanding, whoever holds the authority to draft, to approve, to amend a Constitution, that's the sovereign power. And of course, that's the people. Well, the Constitution was written, debated, Adopted, this moves us on to 1789. George Washington then was officially inaugurated as president. And almost immediately, the American people split into two separate parties, the first parties in American history. Well, why the split? Well, they all knew what they were against. Every American opposed tyranny. And because of their recent experience, they knew exactly what tyranny was. But what are they actually for? Well, these vague notions of liberty and Republican government, and they all assumed they knew what that meant because they all used this language of liberty quite fluently. But what they realized pretty quickly was that not everyone defined these terms the same way. Liberty to some is not what other people had in mind. So each party presented its own vision for the new republic, what liberty under a republic looks like to them. And of course, the difficulty was these two visions did not match at all. Now, the Federalist Party, headed primarily by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, they believed in liberty, they believed in Republican government. Regardless of what their political opponents would later claim, the Federalists were heirs of the Revolution too. They believed in individual rights for all. They did not believe in equal power for all. Liberty belongs to all men. Every man is and should be master of his own personal sphere, lord of his own domain. But public matters of the law, of religion, of education, of the grand institutions of life, those decisions should be made not in the public square, in a public forum, where every citizen would actively engage, but rather effectively behind closed doors where the elites and only the elites would be present. So they, they wanted a republic, but they still believed in the old British idea of a hierarchy, where the gentlemen who were, you know, they possessed the education, the social standing, they thought the wisdom, the temperament, the, the piety, the refinement to exercise this power wisely. Well, throughout the 1790s, the Federalists were the majority party. So, again, we won't go through the long list of their policies, but the upshot is every one of their policies, the intention behind them all was to expand the power of the federal government to preserve power in the hands of the elites. Well, the other side, the Democrat-Republican Party, 
headed by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, well, they had a very different vision. Equal liberty, yes, but also equal power. Not just a republic, but a democratic republic, an egalitarian, equalitarian republic. So what to the Jeffersonians, who were far more radical of the two, the Jeffersonians trusted the wisdom and the ability, the capacity of the common man to actively engage in the public square. So yes, Jeffersonians retorted, public decisions should be made and must be made in the public venue where every citizen can actively participate. Well, in 1800, Jefferson won the White House and his Democrat Republican friends won a resounding victory in Congress. And the Federalist Party soon collapsed, gone forever. So the Jeffersonians were in power for a really, really long time then. Well, their, their agenda was to go to Washington not to do, but to undo everything the Federalists had done. They wanted to repeal all the big government policies of the Federalists. They abolished, not cut, not reduced, not phased out over time, completely and immediately abolished every single internal tax and immediately fired every single tax collector, yet nearly paid off the national debt anyway. Jefferson and his party saw that government regulation, as the Federalists had championed, served the interests not of the common man, but of the elites, whose interests had become increasingly entrenched under Federalist administration. So the Jeffersonian insight was that elites really only have power when artificially backed up by government authority. Liberty, that is less government, promotes fair competition and genuine success, not artificial success of an artificial elite class. Well, as expected, Democrat-Republican policies over the next generation or two led to tremendous economic growth and development, not just for the elites and the middle class, which we would expect, but even for the poor, who soon had access to loans from banks, from capital, to move out west and start a farm, or start a little newspaper, or start a little shop, or whatever it was that would improve their standard of living. Well, again, because of the collapse of the Federalist Party, the Democrat-Republican vision prevailed after 1800. Not just a republic, but a democratic republic. Now, most of the founders back in 76 could never have foreseen, or would they have even you know, celebrated, supported, such an outcome. But it happened all the same. Liberty and power for all. But really for all? What about women? What about slaves? What about free blacks? These groups obviously were not included, not even with the Democrat Republicans. So the full extent of that radical revolution of 1800 carried obvious limitations. Nonetheless, the ideas were there, perhaps not taken as far as we would wish, but the ideas of equal liberty and power were expressed. And once expressed, they could never be unexpressed. Future movements fighting to expand liberty to new groups did not require new ideals. Rather, they simply had to draw on the principles, the ideals of the revolution, especially the more radical Jeffersonian version of those ideals. Future groups want equal power in ways that not even Jefferson himself would have welcomed. In some ways, he would have hated it. But it happened all the same. So those principles of 76 and 1800 created an enduring legacy. So we have traced then the rise of these British understandings of liberty under a monarchy. And we saw how the American generation, founding generation, radicalized those ideals, demanding liberty under a monarch, as a member of republic. And then how the Jeffersonians radicalized them once again, demanding liberty in a democratic republic. Hence, the roots, radicalism, repercussions of the revolution. Now, I have on the screen here several books that I would recommend. If you're curious and want to read more, uh, any of these would be a great place to start. But otherwise, that's all I have for today. So thank you very much.
is fantastic. Let's give him another hand, please. Yeah. What we witnessed, the quality of this uh, presentation, the quality of the instruction that you saw, that you see today, is mirrored in the classroom with our students every single day. It's such a treat to uh, witness it in person. Don't be surprised if I don't enroll in your class next semester. <laughs> <laughs> you see me there, and I won't audit, but you know, be, be easy on me. It's been a while since I've been there. But what a, what a fantastic effort. We really thank you, Matt, for putting this together for us. And I want to thank everybody for showing up today and supporting Matt. Um, it's an honor to be recognized by the Humanities Council. Thank you so much, Ms. Walker, for being here. Uh, and uh, our show is over, but we, we can't wait till next year. And we, I think we've got a winner, and the winner next year, Ms. Walker, is probably going to come from the Southern Center, right? Because we've got, we had Sintopia, we had Oxford, now it's going to be the Southern Center. But thank you all once again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I think that we might even be going on uh, fall break, uh, spring break uh, next week, so that's great. Thank you again.